News First Newsline with Faraz Shaukat Ali. And a splendid evening to you. And this is Newsline live with broadcasting from the News First studios in Dorset Street in Clambo. Now everybody continues uh, to be concerned and uh, are worried, in fact, about the effects of uh, COVID-19 and uh, how the government is coping and how there's a lot of opinion about what the government should be doing, that what they're doing may be right, may be wrong, and so on and so forth. Uh, we've got here with us a gentleman who is the president of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, Professor Indika Karunatilaki is with us. He's no stranger to our program. And we hope to ask him, especially, how come there's such a bigger spread now? The daily figures are increasing. Uh, the death toll has uh, gone up. Um, when we compare our original figures from leaps and bounds. Professor Indika Karnatilika, good evening to you and thank good you. Good evening to you. Um, Professor, why the spread? How come this spread is it's going almost like wildfire? Why? Yes, actually this is a very serious situation. If you compare this with maybe three weeks, four weeks ago, the yeah. numbers are very small. Now, every day about 300, 400 or even 500 patients are coming now. So, what are the reasons for this? I think that's an important question to answer. I think if you compare the two main clusters, that is the Minwangoda, Van Dix and that related cluster and the fish market, we can find a lot of commonalities that would have led to this very rapid spread. For example, mm. both settings, uh, there would have been some lapses related to preventive measures, which might have gone on for some time mm. and if you take both settings they are crowded and uh, congested places with poor ventilation but in that case the um uh but this, uh, surely those factories are uh <coughs> the one that you mentioned uh, are rather well ventilated they they have air conditioning and actually uh, and so air conditioning could be a problem it could be the problem it but then the, the fish market doesn't have the problem uh, okay what you can get there is, I mean, if you take the fish market, mm. outwardly it looked well ventilated mm. with open to outside space. But having said that, in a given time that within that small area, about 3,000 people are moving around with very poor precautions related to preventive measures, a lot of shouting going around that is leading to generation of aerosol and droplets. And, uh, that those kind of environments, whether it's in the factories or it in the fish market, they are the ideal for the rapid spread. Mm. These are events what we call super spread events, where usually the spread of the disease can be slower. But in these kind of settings which are ideal conducive, then the spread can be very fast. So we have very large factories all over the country. Yeah. So even though the factories are large, when the number of workers are also large, yeah. that leads to these kind of situation where it becomes congested, people are working in close confinement. So, and, uh, doctor, yeah. if I, uh, professor, if I put it to you like this, we had the Chinese team that came here. They they said to be traveling in a bubble, a travel bubble. Uh, they said the same about my Pompeo and so on. Mm -hmm. um, in that case, surely, where these factories also can devise uh, worker bubbles because they all work together and if they also shared the same accommodation for example then uh, they, the, the spread can be limited tracking and tracing will be far easier if the, if the need be unlike of course uh, the fish market where there is uh, uncontrolled access, uh, access there is no access system as opposed to like in a factory where there is uh, you know outsiders don't come to a factory in a normal day yeah. Uh, unless they're visitors and then they're checked in, checked out and so on. Mm -hmm. So uh, the fish market is different. It's open to all comers. It's different, but again, there are, again, there are similarities. Like uh, you mentioned about the hostels, which are, if you take the factories, yeah. then there are hostels and the boarding places, which are again crowded and then uh, poorly ventilated and congested. Mm -hmm. And if you take the fish market, most of the workers who are working there, are from the areas around Kalambu, which are again very densely populated, 
with very poor high, so density, the high, high density population. High density population, like say Matakudia, Modera, Valampitia, Palyukoda, so on and so forth. So we are seeing commonalities. So each situation. And what about the habits? The, the habits of these the very workers much, and so very on? Very much. Again, I mean, two settings may be somewhat contrasting, but at the same time, the habits have basically contributed. If you take like the fish what? market, yeah. say if you take the fish market, then uh, adherence to the preventive measures or the hygiene measures has been rather poor. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is again a lot of, I mentioned, like, I, as I mentioned, a lot of shouting going on, a lot of haggling going on, and a lot of people moving around from morning. Uh, and they may be sharing the same cup of tea. Uh, very much. I mean, all these this practices. This is all brotherhood. All, all these practices, I mean, they are about in, in one stall, about uh, 10, 15 per people are congested. That's, I mean, they are the sellers only. So when you add the buyers also, it's a very large number within small confinement. And like you said, sharing of, I mean, the, the main interest is selling fish. So in, within that confinement, sharing of cups, utensils, cigarettes, all these things can happen. And all these practices can lead to very rapid spread. Mm. So, and when you take these workers who are working, in those different places in Colombo, yeah. I mean the congested areas. Now you can understand how rapid this spread can be. Indeed. And um, the, the other thing is now we have the army commander who says that, look, if you've got the symptoms, please report. It makes sense. But, <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying that you have it. Uh, let's say I have it, but I, I don't have the symptoms. So when do I how do I know to tell? I can have a PCR now, like I did last week, and I didn't have it, but how do I know when to tell if I've very, got no symptoms? Very important question. The, the, point, the point you should be asking for medical advice yeah. is not actually when you are having symptoms, because 80% of those who get infected are anyway asymptomatic. They don't get any symptoms. Mm -hmm. The problem is, yeah. you can be infectious even before you get symptoms. Yeah. Even four or five days before you get infected, you can be symptomatic. So if you wait till you get the symptoms, I think you may be too late. Because by that time, you have the potential to spread the disease to others. If we are to stop this epidemic, then you have to stop the spread. That means you have to stop spreading the the disease, the infectivity. So the ideal point is, if you are suspicious that you have come into contact with a potential infected person, or if you suspect that you have been infected, then you should come up. But to come up like that, people should be should have the confidence that they'll be they'll be well looked after, and they will not be stigmatized, mm. and they will not be criminalized. So all these things are important. So I think. Uh, uh, we as healthcare professionals and the media and uh, the health sector, the security forces, everyone, we have a huge role to make sure that the, that the, the public, the general community is empowered to come up. The moment that they know, they suspect that they have been exposed. Uh, no, no, doctor, uh, and th thank you for your questions uh, by SMS 0772 305 The card should come up on your screen. Um, one of our viewers is saying here, how come uh, until September the factories, the markets were all open and working with the same number of people and this break, breakout never happened uh, and then it suddenly escalates like this. Shouting has taken place at the fish markets from time immemorial. True, true. I mean, all these practices have been there. So, at one point, the infection might have been introduced into the fish market because several months ago also there was a concern in the fish market. At that time most of the practices are not much different from at this point. Uh, but at that point it hasn't spread because uh, the, the spread from one person to others hasn't taken place. But this time it was there. So I mean there must have been some kind of introduction of the disease to the fish market. We don't know from where but maybe very likely among the among the seller community. What and about our pets? Let's say I have got it, and you know I'm at home. I'm on home quarantine. I've been exposed to something, uh, to someone, and I'm at home quarantine. What about my dog, my cat? What about them? Very, very unlikely. Very unlikely. Very unlikely. Yeah. There you go. Dogs, you're safe, and cats. 
Um, so honestly, yeah. they can't get it. There, there, there might have been some reports here and there, but yeah. not conclusive. No conclusive proof. No conclusive. There have been some reports, but not conclusive. Right. So, uh, Doctor uh, uh, Professor, back again to the same question: How does the general public know when to? Uh, uh, should they contact the authorities the moment they suspect that they have been exposed to somebody? Ideally, yes. Ideally, yes. Having said that, I mean, all these things has to be combined effort. The one important aspect in the control of this epidemic is contact tracing. That's very important. I think they are the credit should go to the, the intelligence, the national intelligence and the security forces for the excellent job done. So that is one aspect. So a lot of contacts could be could be identified in that way. At the, at the same time, the general public has a responsibility to come up. The moment they suspect that they have come into contact with uh, possible positive uh, patient, then we have the responsibility because otherwise it would be t too late. Um, here we go, another one. Uh, if I'm infected today unknowingly, how long will I remain asymptomatic till I get the actual symptoms? Uh, yeah, the question maybe is it infected or exposed? That depends. Uh, okay, yeah. if, if you are infected? Okay, now if, if someone is exposed, then it will take few days for you to get infected. Right. Few days. Sometimes it can be as short as two days. Sometimes it can be as long as two weeks. Mm. In the Sri Lankan context, it's about about one five days up to one week. Like mm. so, from the point of exposure, about five days would take till you get infected. And once you get infected then the virus would enter into the cells into your nasal cavity and the upper respiratory tract and would multiply there and mm. go down. So, from the point of infection, from the point of infection, there may be about four or five days till you develop symptoms. Right. Yeah. Generally, what the current research shows is from the point of infection till about 10 days, you can be infected. And can we, uh, when we come back from a break, I'll ask you uh, what the difference is between the, the so-called rapid antigen test and the PCR yes. and whether one assists uh, the other or whether it doesn't. On that note, don't go away. After all, you're tuned to um, Newsline Live and uh, we'll come back after this short message. News First, Newsline with Faraz Shaukatali. And welcome back to Newsline Live and we're in discussion with the President of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, Professor Indika Kaunatilak. Um, Professor, what is the difference between the rapid antigen test and the PCR? Yeah, again, very important because there's a lot of discussion about both these tests. Mm. Uh, before I answer, can I very briefly explain Please. what happens with this disease? Yeah, and uh, this disease is caused by a virus called coronavirus, or scientifically we call it SARS-CoV-2. Uh, it has a genetic material called RNA. Some viruses are RNA virus, others are DNA. And this RNA is surrounded by uh, kind of protein molecules, spiky protein molecules, right. and which are combined through lipid layers. Mm -hmm. So those protein molecules can later become antigens right. that can cause a reaction. Okay. And in PCR test what happens is the RNA is detected through a multiplication process which takes several cycles of a, of a biomolecular process about six to eight hours are taken. Mm. And they are also when the virus enters the upper respiratory tract as I mentioned previously, it multiplies within the cells there. So when you take a sample from the upper respiratory tract, you can get those cells, uh, viruses, uh, the material out, and then the RNA is detected through a multiplication process through RT-PCR. Mm -hmm. Then the, the protein molecules in this virus, once they enter, then they enter the nasal cavity and the cells, and later they go into the respiratory tract. And when, the, when our body detects, this foreign material, what we call antigen, the body starts a reaction, right? Uh, an inflammatory reaction, and then uh, bo the body produces protective proteins called antibodies, right, in the blood to fight this antigen. So, 
what we detect in PCR is RNA. What we detect in antigen test is those protein molecules that, that is there in the virus. Right. So both are detected from samples that are taken from the respiratory tract. So the rapid one may give you a pretty good idea what's going on and uh, then you can base your uh, decision to have a PCR based on your rapid mm -hmm. test or not? Okay, yeah. I think when it comes to testing, we should have a very clear idea of why we are doing the testing, what's the purpose. If you want to diagnose the disease, the confirmatory diagnose, the gold standard is PCR. Okay. In Sri Lanka as well as all the countries. So then the why, why bring the antigen test then? In the past, there was no place for antigen. Right. The reason was... What, what do you mean by the past? Say about few months, I mean, we are not, not talking about... Are you about talking pre-COVID or post-COVID? Post-COVID, because I mean, the COVID came only just less than one, one year yeah, ago. So month. science is developing. I mean, uh, when the disease came, again, there were scientists and companies who wanted to develop an antigen test for this. But initially, the test kits that were developed had the sensitivity of only 60% or less, mm. much less, sometimes even less. So that is not appropriate at all, not satisfactory at all. So during the initial time period, antigens were not considered at all because of the poor sensitivity. Right. RT-PCR was a diagnostic test and it remains so. However, recently the product has been improved and WHO has recommended two antigen test kits that have a higher sensitivity over 95 percent, right. which is good enough. Is it still experimental though? No. It is not experimental now, it is in the market also. Right. Under WHO support, Sri Lanka has brought in a consignment as well. The right. purpose of antigen is actually to find out whether someone is infective, yeah. to detect the infectivity. So, this 95% of sensitivity, there is a time period. Mm. The infectivity that I was talking about, so there is no point of using the antigen test just for mass screening. Right. Because there is a particular time period. So this has to be specifically used, specifically used to detect the infectivity of high high risk populations. So that could be it, it could be used for that. Okay. So we have to be very careful. But the gold standard is the PCR. Gold standard remains the PCR. For if you want to diagnose, it is PCR. If you want to find out the level of infectivity within a risk population, like maybe factory workers or so on and so forth, and if they show some symptoms, you may go for antigen test right so it has some purpose but a limited purpose what i want to say is actually when it comes to testing it has to be rational but why the huge difference in cost between the uh, P, uh, pcr can cost anything between six to nine thousand rupees obvious the, the the process because what happens in rt pcr is a very complex process where you get the material so and transport them and uh, then it's, it's been allowed to duplicate the rna is been allowed to copy it and duplicate but doctor, with, with all due respect if somebody yeah. is earning thirty thousand rupees a month and they have to fork out let's take a medium eight thousand rupees um that's pretty, that's a lot of money. It's, it's over 20%. It, 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 it is a lot of money. It's a lot of money. It's over 20%. Yeah, I mean, and if you take the country... And what about, I mean, the, what about the state hospitals? How much do they charge? State hospitals don't charge. They, they don't charge? They don't charge. So th that is the important factor. Now, see a country like Sri Lanka. Right. About, about uh, one month ago, Sri Lanka was doing about 2,000 RT-PCR tests per day. Mm. And within last one, three, uh, last one month, mm. it has gone up to basically I mean uh, gone up to uh, about 9,000 10,000 tests per day and there's a huge increase and uh, increase in the capacity up to that level is in a way is commendable at the same time it is not a limit that the country's resources can uh, tolerate for a very long time it's not easy because I mean so expensive the resources that are required so it's very very important that those tests are done rationally well, you know earlier we spoke about the uh uh, the shouting in the fish markets, yes. the, um, the, uh, the density of the workplace in yes. any factory, yes. um, and so on. I, I just thought I'd ask you, yes. what, uh, especially because you said about the shouting, yeah. um, what about uh, that other place 
in Kur, you know, in Sri Jayawardenapura, sometimes called the parliament, they shout there and they're not wearing masks. They're inside the chamber and they're all shouting and they sh they're shouting themselves hoarse. I don't know, I, I can imagine the damage being done to their vocal cords, but what about the spitting and all that? Possibly the risk is there, but maybe the place is a very large place and then the space is there, so it may not be as crowded as the fish market. Uh, yeah. So, but the risk is there, risk is there. Right, there yeah. is a risk. Yes, there is, I mean, regardless of whether... Shall we quarantine all of them? I don't, I, I don't know whether you want, don't, don't answer that because you're working in the state. But you know, I, I thought we better ask that because that's, um, as much as um, uh, the industry, you know, factories and so on are also places, so, so is that. That's got okay, to I mean, I mean, light-hearted comments apart, let's take this very clearly. Yeah. I mean, whatever situation where there are many people with confined or poor ventilation, and in close confinement and uh, in a longer time period yeah. and uh, with a lot of talking and discussing going on, that's a high risk environment, wherever. It could be a theatre, it could be maybe fish market or it could be a meeting place, wherever, these are high risk environments. So basically the essence has got to be hands, face, space. Exactly, exactly. And most importantly, I think, hands important, but space and the mask. Absolutely essential. Yeah, absolutely essential. And that is the... Especially when you go into high-risk environments, like I have mentioned previously, yes. And how, how much must the uh, big markets, the fish markets, the vegetable markets, how much of control? Should, are, you, are you firm believer that the the access must be controlled and you can't just have 3,000 people just going in there. Exactly. Fully, fully agree. I mean, all of us accept and the government also feels that the country has to go. Country has to start the businesses, the economic. I mean, I don't think there should be any doubt about that. But it should be with, with very strict control. Say, if you are to open maybe the fish market, you can't have all 3,000 people coming in yeah. and flocking. It's not possible. And you can't have all of them shouting and then moving around. It has but to I don't be think we're going to stop them shouting as much as we can't shout. Uh, sh you, you can actually. You can. I mean, but they can shout with their mouths on. No, no. What you can do is, I mean, have the, have the prices put in the boards. So, so then they don't have to shout. Yeah, I mean, there, there are some practices like, I mean, shouting is one of the, say, selling strategies. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, those things are there. But in these kind of situations, you definitely have to put strict control measures in. Yeah. So, a simple measure could be putting the prices written down in a board. As simple as that. It's as simple as yeah. that. I, I think this is what we call new normal. We have to move towards a new normal. And if, we are, if the country has to move forward, we have to think about the post-COVID new normal, how we can adapt. So all these sectors, maybe marketing, maybe say stores, transport, all these areas, I think we need to adapt to the new normal. And new normal, one principle is reduction of overcrowding. It's a must. We must, we we must, must have we must. a reduction in overcrowding. No doubt about that. I mean, so, this, is, this is the root cause. Overcrowding, poor sanitation, poor ventilation, that is the root cause. Professor Indika Karnatilaka, thank you very much. But uh, my control room says that it's time for the prime time news. So uh, remember, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, you know, it's uh, hands, uh, face, and space. Take care, have a great evening ahead of you, and of course, God bless you.